Becca, thank you very much. Well, um, could I ask you to keep Romans chapter 1 open in front of you, and uh, we'll uh, have a look at that together. We've prayed in song. I'm going to pray uh, again just uh, those words we've sung. Uh, let's um, pause as we ask for God's help again. Living Lord, please open our hearts and our wills and our minds and show us wonderful things that we might be involved in doing wonderful things for your glory's sake. Amen. Uh, this morning I want us to think about um, one question and it's this, uh, what makes a gospel church? Uh, there's the question there. We use the word gospel um, to describe things all sorts of, in all sorts of ways. And often I think we assume what we know we're talking about. We talk about gospel churches. We talk about gospel ministry. We talk about gospel people. And uh, I think it's often assumed that we know what we're talking about. What makes a gospel church? What do we mean by a gospel church? Uh, is it a church that talks a lot about Jesus? Some might think so. Perhaps if you've been brought up in a tradition that doesn't do that very much, you think, well, that's a gospel church. They just go on and on about him. It's a bit annoying. Is it a church that talks a lot about the gospel? Would that make a gospel church? Perhaps it's a bit sharper than talking about Jesus. Maybe if you talk about the gospel, well, that makes you a gospel church. Is it a church that has Bibles in the chairs? I think I uh, thought that for many years. Our church at home when I was growing up didn't have Bibles in the church, and then I started hearing uh, talks about the gospel, and they always had Bibles in the chairs. Is it a church that has sermons that last more than 15 minutes? Again, I think I probably used to think that. That would make a gospel church. They're very serious about the whole Christian thing. That's surely a, sh a gospel kind of place. Is it a church that thinks it's a gospel church? Are we a gospel church? We, I suppose, would certainly think so. Perhaps that's why we come. We're evangelical. That means we believe that the Bible is important. We are Bible-believing and Bible-driven people. We're evangelical. Surely we are a gospel church. But what I want to do this morning is to check. And I want to use Romans chapter 1 to do that checking. We won't look at all of it because there's a lot there, but I want to look at two things which Paul is saying will be the essential features of a gospel church. And I hope as we do that, it will help those who perhaps are just weighing up whether to be part of things here, whether to become a, a member, to sign the partnership form. And it will certainly help all of us regulars who think we're gospel churches or gospel people to check and to encourage us to keep living as gospel people in 2014. Two features then, and the first is a deep conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord of all people. That's the first feature that Paul is describing. He's describing a deep conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord of all people. Um, as you look at um, this letter of Romans, it's all about the gospel. Uh, the word gospel or preach the gospel, it comes about 12 times through the letter, eight of which are right at the start or right at the end. So he's saying, I'm talking a lot about this thing, the gospel. And as he starts his letter, he begins with a sort of standard greeting. He's saying, I'm Paul and I'm this kind of person. But it is significantly extended. And all the extension in verses 1 to 6 are about the gospel. In fact, um, uh, those first six verses, they make for a very informative one-question Bible study. What does this passage say about the gospel? If you're normal and you're struggling with your Bible reading, why not this week do that? A Bible study on verses 1 to 6 asks the question, what do we learn about the gospel? Paul is saying, as I write about the gospel, a word which we may be very familiar with, let's be absolutely sure that we know what we're talking about. And let's see what Paul says about it, just some of the things. In verse 2, he says, this gospel is not a new thing. If you just look at the gospel, it's the gospel of God. It's the gospel that God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. 
Paul's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the writers of the Old Testament. That's what he's calling the prophets. He's saying that this message of salvation about Christ, it's been lying dormant, if you like, in the Old Testament, and now it's come to a fruition. But it's, it's always been the plan. So uh, remember, if you're someone who's not so keen on the Old Testament, we can't fully understand the gospel without it. Equally remember, when we read the Old Testament, if we enjoy learning just about the Old Testament characters and events, if your Bible reading notes only ever give you lessons from the Old Testament characters, we're missing out on the full meaning until we see their fulfillment in Christ. The gospel is not new, it was always there. He's also saying the gospel is about Jesus, verse 3, right at the front. In the Holy Scriptures, it's regarding his son. Now, to a church that thinks it's a gospel church, that sounds almost patronizing to say. By the way, it's about Jesus. But uh, how often can we steal the attention and tend to make the gospel something to do with us? Do you know the sort of thing? Well, it's about my salvation. It's about my forgiveness. It's about my fulfillment now that I know God. Those things are, of course, involved and they're affected. But we are not the subject of the gospel. It's funny how it doesn't take much of a mental slip, does it, to make our our Christian living, to make our reading of the Bible, to make our talking to God something that is centered on self, on me. The gospel is saying there is one powerful and loving Lord of all, and it's not us. It is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the subject of the gospel. He is the center. He is the focus. And in verse 3, he goes on to underline a couple of things about this Jesus. He underlines, firstly, that he was genuinely human. See how he goes on to describe him regarding his son in verse 3, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David. Jesus is that the culmination of the Old Testament in the sense of being in the bloodline of King David. He's the real Messiah. He's a human Messiah. So he's not pretending to be a human person. He's truly human, just like you and me. But as well, he is clearly divine. Verse 4, who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God. And how is he declared to be that? By his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. The humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus. Now, if you want to look at that in more detail, there's going to be a stream at soul food on the person of Christ What does it mean to say he's fully man and at the same time fully God? How do they relate and why is that significant for us? If you want to look at that more, uh, do sign up for that stream at Soul Food. But briefly, Paul says here that that was clear when the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. He became a son of God in power. He was always the son of God, but then he was a powerful son of God as he rose from the dead. And verse 5 concludes, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that's the essence of the gospel in a condensed way of explaining it. It's about Jesus, but it also is Jesus Christ as Lord. That's the message. And the gospel church will have a deep conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord. Where Lord means the divine ruler over every person. So as you sign up on your form today, and I hope you will, just check you have that settled conviction. Jesus Christ is Lord of all people. I was listening to the radio with a a member of our wider family the other day, and um, there was some debate on the radio. I I can almost not remember what it was. I think it was about the amount of sugar in food. You may have heard that debate, and all sorts of shock about the number of teaspoonfuls there are in cans of Coke and Mars bars and things like that. And there were two sides to the debate, as there often are, and uh, we were discussing similarly. And the common phrases in those sort of discussions, you probably know them, are things like, well, in my view, there's enough sugar in natural food or whatever it was. As I see it, this, that, and the other. We're sharing our views. We're sharing our opinions. That's what makes, that's what makes the debate. The gospel church is not saying that Jesus Christ is Lord is one possible view in the world. 
Now, as we talk to each other, that's exactly what it feels like. As we talk to the world out there, that's what it feels like. We're just one view among many. But it's not how some people see it, according to the Bible. The reason is because it's not simply a matter of opinion, because the resurrection is not simply a matter of opinion. The resurrection is a standout event because it is historically verifiable. You can examine it. You can attest to it. It's not a view which doesn't matter either way. Think of a, of a classroom situation, the sort of classic thing. The teacher's gone out of the room, the pupils are, are running riot, uh, everyone's behaving as if they own the place, but the teacher then returns. And some people can see that because they're facing the door. And so they immediately stop behaving as if they own the place and they sit down. And they start to urge their friends to sit down as well because others have their backs to the door. They cannot see that the one in charge has arrived. And so some people are trying to say to them, he's here, sit down, shh, get up. That's not just in their view. That's not just as they see it. The teacher is actually back. Everyone needs to know that. Now the resurrection is the same. It's declaring what is actually the case in the universe. Jesus Christ is in charge He's proved that by being the only one in the universe to rise from the dead, to die and rise again, never to die again. The gospel church is saying more than Jesus Christ is very important. It's saying more than Jesus Christ is at the center of everything. It's saying even more than Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. The gospel church is saying Jesus Christ is Lord of all people because he is risen from the dead in the way no one else has. That's why in verse 5, there is a call to all people. He goes on, through Jesus, and for Jesus' name's sake, we've received grace and apostleship, that's Paul describing that, to call people from among all the Gentiles. So it's a call to those people who expect to be called, that would be the Jews in Paul's case, and to the unexpected to the Gentiles in Paul's case. And if Jesus is Lord of all, then all are summoned. All are called to come to him. And that's the last phrase of verse 5, you see. To call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. Now, it is true that if you're a Christian person, obedience will follow trusting Jesus. It will come from faith in that sense. This phrase actually says the obedience of faith or the obedience which is faith in other words the gospel of Jesus is so much more than an offer it is not simply to be wondered about and considered it's to be obeyed the obedience which is faith I was talking with a friend some, uh, some years back who was uh, in the marketing department for a telecommunications company which I realized meant he sold mobile phones. And in the course of describing his work, he said, you've got to work out what people want. And then he said to me, much like you. He knew I, he knew I was a vicar. Meaning that if we're to fill a church building, we've got to work out what people want. We've got to market the product well. Jesus Christ is not a product that we offer people. Of course, we need to be warm, we need to be welcoming, we need to present the truth well. But Jesus Christ as Lord is actually a summons. The gospel is a command. The call to faith is a call to obey. We are urging people to submit themselves to the loving rule of Jesus. That is to bring their lives into line with reality. The reality that Jesus is alive and he's Lord of all. There's some children at a local Church of England primary school to here have a topic this term of Islam. They've got a trip to a mosque, which will be very interesting and uh, fascinating, I think. And our children need to know, don't they, that only Jesus of Nazareth has risen from the dead. Only he is Lord, and he's Lord of all people, of all religions. That's what these verses are saying. That is Paul's conviction. And as you sign bits of paper today, just check, is that your conviction too? Is it our conviction? Is it your deep conviction? 
that Jesus Christ is Lord of all people. He's Lord of your parents, your children, your grandparents, your grandchildren, your siblings. He's Lord of your work colleagues. He's Lord of your next door neighbors. He's Lord of every one of us here. He's Lord of the ones that we see. He's Lord of the ones that we don't see so much. He's Lord of the ones that we get on with really well. He's Lord of the ones that we don't get on with quite so well. And as you go on in Romans, you see that that's why this truth, Jesus Christ is Lord, is the truth that unites a church and humbles a church. That's the gospel church, a deep conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord of all people. Now, um, what you believe, a conviction, that is one thing. Uh, What you do is a wholly other thing. Uh, You may have heard of C.T. Studd, uh, the famous cricketer turned missionary and uh, famous for his all-out dedication to the cause of the gospel. And he was someone who responded to the call of Hudson Taylor to go to China. And it is said that what spurred him to such all-out commitment, giving up this cricketing career and all the rest of it, was an article that he read written by an atheist bemoaning the inconsistency in Christians between what they believed and how they lived. This is some of the article by this atheist. It said, If I firmly believed, as millions do, that knowledge and practice of the Christian faith in this life influences destiny in another, I would labor in its cause alone. I would take thought for eternity alone. I would reckon one soul gained for heaven worth a life of suffering. He spotted a bit of a mismatch. And Paul is saying that for those with a deep conviction about Jesus, there is a corresponding, a consistent mark, a consistent feature of their lives. See, it's one thing, isn't it, to be, to be very clear in your understanding. But what about your longing? You may well be very clear in your thinking about Jesus. What about your strength of feeling? What about your heart? What about your zeal? Is it consistent with your conviction? The gospel church is not simply one with clear convictions. The gospel church is one with fervent passions. And all those passions will determine its use of time and money and energy. So the gospel church will certainly have a conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord. But it won't just have a deep conviction. It will as well have an eager desire that Jesus Christ is preached to all. Now just glance to verse 15. This is where Paul talks about his eager desire. Now Paul, in the uh, middle few verses, he's describing his relationship with the Romans, and it's a remarkable relationship given that uh, he hasn't actually met them yet, and he thanks God for them, and he prays for them, and he says he longs to be with them. And in particular, in verse 15, he is eager to preach the gospel to them. And the eagerness stems from a couple of things. The first is his sense of obligation. He has an obligation he feels to all kinds of people. Just look at verse 14. He says, I am bound. I owe it to both to Greeks and to non-Greeks. That is, the sort of intelligent, highbrow people, but also the the uneducated, those that the highbrow would frown upon. Paul says he owes it to both kinds of people to preach the gospel, the wise and the foolish. So um, think of of the classroom scene again, but sort of um, grow it a bit. Think of it on a national or a grander scale, not a classroom, but a whole country, a whole nation. And uh, it's taken over suddenly by a good new king, a ruler who's got every interest that is good for his people. So the new state of affairs is that there is a new king over this nation. And the king appoints a herald who's going to declare the king's rule to all the people of the nation. And the king is in charge, and the message is that for all who submit to him and come to him, there's a free pardon. Now that herald has a responsibility partly to the king, to fulfill what he's got to do, but he has an obligation as well to the citizens of the nation. He owes it to them to tell them the good news, the urgent news. And Paul's obligation here is is along those lines. It is a unique one because he's an apostle, 
but it is an obligation to all kinds of people in verse 14. Now, Christians, we've got a similar obligation to those around us. Here in Westbourne, uh, we're surrounded by all kinds of people. Uh, Not every kind of person, but many kinds of people. And because Jesus is Lord of all of them, we have an obligation to all of them. Um, I've identified before, and I uh, still think this is the case, we have an obligation here to three particular people groups. I think a gospel church in Westbourne will be eager to preach Jesus to young parents and their children. And I mentioned the, the Chris Dingle service at Christmas time. I think we saw more than ever families who wouldn't normally be part of a church, who wouldn't call themselves Christians. Those through the, uh, the midweek toddlers groups, the pebbles groups as we're calling them now. And we have a great responsibility to young families. A, a gospel church in Westbourne will be eager to preach Jesus to all kinds of the older generation. Uh, I'm not going to suggest what age that refers to because I'll get into trouble. But with uh, many older people moving into this area and uh, retiring to this area, what an opportunity. Jesus is Lord of each one of those. Are we not eager to preach him to each one of those? A gospel church in Westbourne will be eager to preach Jesus Christ to all those around us who come from other countries, that is, to the language school students, to the internationals working in the area. And this week in particular, we've got a meeting to pray and to plan how we do that as well as we possibly can and in, in to build on what's been done so well. Some will serve in that work particularly, but I just want to say uh, on this morning that internationals ministry is an every member ministry. A good friend of ours, he's run this kind of church work very fruitfully over a number of years. He's convinced that one of the keys to making international work fruitful is that our normal Sundays must be as welcoming as they possibly can be for those from other countries. Of course, there'll be different language abilities, but how do we make our Sundays even more international friendly? Don't wait to be on a welcome team to say hello to someone from another country. Now, all that is eagerness to preach the gospel to unbelievers. But I don't know if you noticed, uh, the Apostle Paul doesn't make very much of distinguishing between unbelievers and believers. And interestingly, in verse 15, as we've uh, seen, he's eager to preach the gospel to the church itself, to the Christians. If Jesus is Lord of all, he is, of course, Lord of each one of us, if we call ourselves a Christian. And we need it preached that he's Lord as we seek to live for him. And that's why as we sign this form today, we're agreeing to those things that I mentioned earlier. We're agreeing that we need the scriptures. We're agreeing that we need to meet together on Sundays to hear those scriptures. We're agreeing to need to to do that regularly. A weekly ideally, but sometimes things crop up. But certainly not just once a month when it fits. So you may know that Christ is Lord of all people, but let me ask you, are you eagerly desiring that he's preached to all people, to all those around us, to others around you in here? Are you eager that Christ is preached to you? Because if I'm convinced Jesus Christ is Lord of all, if I have an eager desire that he's preached to all, I will will pour my praying into that work. I was asked a very challenging question this week and I think it's worth, worth each of us thinking about. I wonder what your answer would be to this question. For whose salvation will you pray most fervently this year? There's quite a lot of assumptions in that question. For whose salvation will you pray most fervently this year? Tomorrow evening such a good opportunity to express this eagerness together. Please come. Please come. And don't underestimate the enormous encouragement to others of deciding to come, of being there, especially if you've never been before. There's another question I was asked this week, which takes a bit of thinking about. Let me ask you it. What single thing that you plan to do this year will matter most in eternity? Quite hard to answer that question, but it's worth thinking about. What single thing that you plan to do this year will matter most in eternity. 
will best serve Christ preach, you could ask it. Whether or not I actually do the preaching of the gospel, I'll do all I can to make it happen. I'll pour my gifts into it happening. I'll pour my money into that happening. But I'll have no desire to do those things if I'm not deeply convicted that he's Lord of all. So Paul has this eager desire that Jesus is preached. It comes from this obligation. It comes as well, just very briefly, from verse 16, which is a a confidence in the gospel. Verse 16 actually begins with the word for or because. He says, I'm eager because I'm not ashamed. He's eager because he's not worried about any sort of public disgrace for preaching the gospel. Very strangely, it's the message of Jesus that actually saves people. That's how God has arranged things. And it saves every kind of person, he says, whether you're religious or materialistic or intellectual or international or young or old. The gospel is how somebody is saved. And knowing that, Paul is eager. He's obliged to people and he's eager. Now, there'll be many things this year that will be keen happen. It might be to do with our physical state of things. We want to get through the year without any further problems. We want to get over this problem. It might be that we're keen to to stay in a job or to stop work or to move house. We're very keen to fix the family. We're just keen that our team stays up or whatever it is. But let me ask you, what is it you will desire most? What will you eagerly desire in the thick of all the other desires? And if at all you find that a tough question to answer, and it may well be, we need to go back down the line a bit. Are we clear that Jesus Christ is Lord of all? That the best good for all people in the world is that they see and live under his lordship. Gospel people and a gospel church won't simply agree that Jesus is preached to all. They won't simply be happy enough that Jesus is preached to all. They won't even realize that some at church will be into Jesus preached to all. Any gospel person will eagerly desire that Jesus is preached. And the use of their gifts, their prayers, their money will reflect that desire. And they'll keep desiring it year by year. Because at the other end of Romans, do you remember chapter 12, Paul says, never be lacking in zeal. J.C. Ryle said, the zealous person is preeminently a person of one thing. He has a care for one thing. He lives for one thing. He's swallowed up in one thing. If you're a person who believes that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, will you be utterly consumed by Jesus Christ being preached to all? Let's pause and uh, you might like to pray quietly on your own before we sing our final song.